Sharpening Skills for the TOEFL IBT Four Practice Tests Book 1 Listening Section Listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. So, we have been talking about human cognitive and social development. Now, I'd like to move along to discuss Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, a very influential theory that has been widely applied both inside and outside the field of psychology in um, education, social work, and even criminal justice. Now, Maslow began his career studying the behavior of monkeys, and um, one of the most interesting things he noticed was that some of the monkeys' needs took precedence over others. Some needs appeared to be more important. For example, if the monkeys were both hungry and thirsty, they would seek water before food. See, you can only live for a few days without water, but food... Well, food is still important, you still have to eat, but the need for water is stronger. The monkeys also needed to play to get exercise, but the needs for food and water were more pressing. Out of his observations of monkeys and later observation of people, Maslow developed his ideas into the now famous hierarchy of human needs. Let's take a look at each layer of these needs in greater detail. As the monkey story illustrates, the first layer, the physiological needs, is the foundation, the needs that must be met first. Unless you get enough oxygen, water, protein, salt, sugar, vitamins, and minerals, and unless you maintain a healthy pH balance, body temperature, and so on, you won't live long enough to worry about very many other needs. Moving on, the second layer of needs is, uh, the need for safety and security. So, let's say you meet all your physiological needs. Soon, you'll probably start thinking about finding stability and protection, developing structure, creating order, those kinds of things. Defined negatively, when you're no longer hungry and thirsty, fears and anxieties are your next concern. You want to find a safe neighborhood, job security, a retirement plan, and so on. Meet these needs, uh, and you'll focus on the needs for love and belonging, which is the third level in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You have your food, your comfortable shelter, your job security, and you begin to feel the need for friends, a partner, a sense of community even. If you don't meet these needs, you'll grow susceptible to loneliness and social anxieties, a major problem in modern urban societies, uh, alienation. There are socially acceptable ways to meet these needs, getting married, joining a club or church, and less socially acceptable ways, like joining a gang or getting involved in a drug culture. Now, we're at the fourth level, esteem, needs, and here, pay attention, Maslow notes two subsets. The lower one is the need for respect from others, status, fame, glory, recognition, get the idea? The higher form involves the need for self-respect, confidence, uh, achievement, freedom even. Now, this stratification of esteem needs is often debated, though I think Maslow had it right in the first place. Self-respect is the higher form. Unlike the respect of others, and we all know how fickle that is, once you gain self-respect, it's a lot harder to lose. Fail to meet your esteem needs and you're a candidate for some significant psychological problems. Maslow didn't believe humans could meet all four levels of their needs and just stop and be content. They would continuously need to grow, emotionally, cognitively, and socially. This is what he refers to as self-actualization, the fifth level. Few people meet all four preceding levels of their needs. So, Maslow had less of an observable basis to define what self-actualization meant. And, let's face it, this level is also the most abstract, the hardest to pin down. He did point out that self-actualized individuals, at least the ones he observed, tended to be autonomous, not overly concerned about social norms, yet at the same time had a strong sense of ethics and concern for the human species. They demonstrate a non-hostile sense of humor as well as a sense of humility and respect for others. They tended to be very creative, inventive people. One thing educators, for example, have taken from Maslow's theory is the importance of making sure children have their most basic needs met as forming an important foundation 
on which to teach them not only knowledge, but also the values of self-respect and respect for others. Let's take a brief look at how this is done, okay? Now get ready to answer the questions. You may... Number 1. What is the lecture mainly about? Number 2. According to the professor, what did Maslow realize from studying monkeys? Number 3. According to the professor, which of the following is a feature of self-actualized individuals? Number 4. In the lecture, the professor describes the layers in Maslow's hierarchy of human needs. Indicate whether each of the following is mentioned as one of those layers. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now we're at the fourth level, esteem, needs, and here, pay attention, Maslow notes two subsets. The lower one is the need for respect from others, status, fame, glory, recognition. Get the idea? Number 5. Why does the professor say this? Status, fame, glory, recognition. Get the idea? Number 6. What would the professor most likely talk about next? Listen to part of a conversation between a student and a professor. Hi, Professor Wallerstein. Hi, Joyce. What can I do for you? Uh, remember how I asked you if I could have an extension to finish my final paper for the term? Well, uh, I have a little problem. Right. I said that you could hand the paper in on Thursday morning before I leave for my conference. Oh, that's tomorrow already. Okay, so what's the problem? Well, I... My computer crashed and I lost the paper, all my notes, my final revisions, everything. I don't know what to do now. I really put a lot of work into this paper. Remember how I showed you my draft twice? I don't want you to think that I... Okay, look. These kinds of things happen. Have you checked with the computer support department to see if they can recover your paper from your computer? A guy named James over there is really great. He helped me with a similar problem once. Why don't you talk to him and see what he can do? Yeah, I know him. I already went there this morning. He said my computer had this big virus, and that's what crashed it. And, well, it pretty much ate my hard drive. I see. Hmm. Well, I still need your paper by tomorrow so that I can get the final grades in before I leave. You still have your last draft that I commented on, right? Yeah. Now, I realize that I handed the most recent one back to you last week, but why don't you try to outline some of the major revisions you made? Then you can type it all up in one of the computer labs and get it to me by tomorrow morning. It just isn't possible for me to give you an extension beyond that. Unfortunately, I don't get to decide when grades are due. Well, I'll give it a shot, but I know it's not going to be as good as what I wrote before the computer crashed. I understand that, Joyce, but we don't always get to choose our deadlines, so just do the best you can and get it to me by tomorrow. If you don't agree with the grade you end up with, we can discuss it before next semester starts up. Your second draft showed that you made considerable improvements over your first, and I always consider a student's efforts toward improvement a factor in my grading. Okay. Thanks, Professor. I'll get the paper to you first thing in the morning. Great. I can't wait to read it. I'll be in my office between 9 and 10. Good luck. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Number 7. Why does the student go to see her professor? Number 8. What does the student say about the computer support department? Number 9. 
What did James say about the woman's computer? Number 10. Why must the student hand in the paper tomorrow morning? Choose two answers. Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. Okay, look, these kinds of things happen. Have you checked with the computer support department to see if they can recover your paper from your computer? A guy named James over there is really great. He helped me with a similar problem once. Why don't you talk to him and see what he can do? Number 11. What can be inferred about the professor's attitude? Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. Your second draft showed that you made considerable improvements over your first, and I always consider a student's efforts toward improvement a factor in my grading. Number 12. Why does the professor say this? I always consider a student's efforts toward improvement a factor in my grading. Listen to part of a lecture in a history class. Today we're going to talk about what spices meant to medieval Europeans, what symbolic value they had. Most of you never give much thought to the salt and pepper in the cafeteria, or the supermarket, or a restaurant, am I right? They're inexpensive, readily available, pretty boring, you might say, both of them. We tend to think of salt and pepper as a pair, but they actually have very dissimilar histories. Different journeys that led them to end up on our dinner tables. First, let's look at salt. In moderation, it is an essential part of a healthy diet, but it's so common nowadays we wouldn't consider it valuable. The attitude was different in, say, some kingdoms of Africa that maintained ancient salt trading routes across the Sahara Desert, some of which still exist today. Of course, people need some in their diet. But it was valuable mostly because it was one of the few substances known to keep foods from spoiling quickly. Our word salary comes from the Roman practice of paying soldiers partly in salt rather than entirely in money. But, um, back to my point, trying to lay out some symbolism for you here. While medieval Europeans would have considered salt a very necessary substance, they also considered it very mundane, nothing special, sort of like how we see it today. Now, pepper was the exact opposite. Medieval Europeans developed quite a powerful taste for pepper and other spices like cinnamon and、uh, nutmeg. Sure, you could use pepper or nutmeg or cinnamon to season your food, but、uh, they're not essential to the diet like salt. Some people believe that these spices were important for preserving food or even flavoring food that was no longer fresh. Well, that's not such a good explanation for the popularity of these spices. As medieval Europeans already had salt and plenty of native herbs to flavor or preserve food. Does anyone have any ideas why pepper and other spices might have been so popular? How about you, Diane? Maybe they taste better? Sort of. You're headed in the right direction. I mean, uh, they were more desirable and taste may have been one factor, but something that's strange or different or exotic might be more interesting, right? And so, It was with pepper and other such spices like cinnamon, ginger,、uh, cardamom. Uh, sorry, Professor, but how exactly could pepper be exotic? Good question. See, they didn't call this time period the Dark Ages for nothing. Travel and commerce across long distances were dangerous and rare. Your、uh, average European was generally not in contact with anyone outside his or her local world, say within a 10 mile radius or so, except through the church. But that's a whole different issue that we're going to bypass for the moment. Uh, now where was I? Oh, yes, so pepper came mainly from India and cinnamon from Ceylon, what we now call Sri Lanka. But very few medieval Europeans had the slightest idea where they came from. All they knew was that merchants could buy spices from Arabs in Egypt. Where the Arabs got them from was a mystery. So the spices were valuable just because they came from far away? Yes, right. But even more than that, 
And this is what I want you to get out of our discussion today. Because spices were rare, pretty much only purchased by the upper classes, nobility, not by the masses. There's no way you'd find pepper on a table in a medieval university dining hall. And if you did, you wouldn't take it for granted. You'd feel pretty special eating it. Because they came from so far off, well, the disconnected Europeans weren't quite sure where a lot of them came from, spices were actually thought to have their origins in paradise. Uh, so people actually believed spices came from heaven? Well, not exactly what we think of as heaven today. In the worldview of medieval Europeans, paradise was some physical place on earth, someplace far off and unknown, but real. That's what gave exotic spices their symbolic value. Salt, like salt today, was available to all, a very democratic item, you might say. Pepper, cinnamon, and so on were reserved exclusively for the aristocrats, kings, queens, ruling nobility. Spices were more than useful. They set the rulers apart from their subjects and suggested that they, uh, the higher classes, were closer to paradise than the commoners. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Number 13. What is the lecture mainly about? Number 14. According to the professor, why was salt so valuable to early peoples? Number 15. According to the professor, Europeans probably did not. Number 16. Why does the professor mention that most Europeans in the Dark Ages only knew about the world within a 10-mile radius of their homes? Number 17. What does the professor suggest about medieval European attitudes toward pepper and salt? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Travel and commerce across long distances were dangerous and rare. Your, uh, average European was generally not in contact with anyone outside his or her local world, say within a 10-mile radius or so, except through the church. But that's a whole different issue that we're going to bypass for the moment. Number 18. Why does the professor say this? But that's a whole different issue that we're going to bypass for the moment. Listen to part of a lecture in an anthropology class. Afternoon, all. Let's begin, shall we? So, this morning we're going to talk about kinship and descent. We know that all societies face similar questions of how to facilitate economic cooperation between men and women, how to provide a proper setting for raising children, and how to regulate reproductive activity. Over time, the results of these choices form patterns of family organization. Um, what anthropologists call kinship structures. Today, we're going to look at one type of kinship structure, the descent group. Now, a descent group is any publicly recognized social entity in which being a lineal descendant of a particular real or mythical ancestor is a criterion for membership. Um, in other words, people will claim a direct lineal, as in following a line, a lineal relationship to an ancestor. That ancestor could be a mythical individual or maybe even a known historical individual. Now, what's important here to understand membership structure is that to belong to this descent group, in some cases called an extended family, but we'll get to that in a minute, an individual would have to demonstrate a connection to the founding ancestor, and that connection would have to be publicly recognized. That is, the descent group would have to recognize whether or not the individual, mm, well, belongs. So, as you can see, we're talking about group formation here. And for many societies, kinship organizations, families in everyday language, are an extremely important social institution. Hmm, perhaps the most important group an individual may belong to. 
Okay, back to my point. Descent groups. This specific type of family organization includes several, if not many, generations, and will also branch outward. You might have guessed that we're talking about extended families here, not just the immediate family. Let's say you live with your mother and father, a sister and a grandmother, your mother's mother. This would be your household. Now, when we talk about an extended family, we're talking about something far larger. That would be all the individuals you can trace as relatives. Now then, here's where descent groups get interesting. Anthropologists study the rules descent groups use to decide membership. Where do you draw that line between who are your relatives and who aren't? And what are the consequences? I want to talk about two specific patterns for tracing membership in descent groups, matrilineal descent and patrilineal descent. There are others as well, but we'll just focus on these two for today. Both matrilineal and patrilineal descent trace membership along one line, either the mother's line, matrilineal, or the father's line, patrilineal. One line only. And this has implications for, well, for where a son or daughter lives, when he or she gets married, what family name a child will take, how inheritance is transferred from one generation to another, among other things. These things vary from society to society, so let's just look at the more general patterns that show up in these two cases. Patrilineal descent is the more widespread of the two systems. Rural society in a traditional China, for example, was strongly patrilineal. Typically, extended families were the basic unit for economic cooperation, with households often including elderly parents, a son, the son's wife, and the son's children. Often, the son's brother and his wife and children were members of the household as well. A father was responsible for disciplining his children, and his children were also expected to treat their father's brothers with respect and obedience. Families were organized into descent groups called tsu, but these groups are sometimes referred to as clans in the literature. Although a daughter moved to the household of her husband's family, she remained in her father's su. Her children, however, would belong to their father's su. The function of the su was to assist members economically. Members would come together to share costs and labor for weddings, ancestral feasts, and funerals. Rural China was a hugely agrarian society. That's agricultural, right? Well, we often find patrilineal descent in societies with extensive agriculture. Okay then, matrilineal descent, on the other hand, is typically found in pastoral or horticultural societies, that smaller scale or garden scale farming of crops. The Hopi of the American Southwest, for instance, are divided into a number of clans based on strict matrilineal descent. At birth, each individual is assigned to membership in his or her mother's clan. Members of the clan are expected to support each other. In village life, these clans break into smaller sub-clans or lineages, each headed by a senior woman, although she shares leadership with her brother or her mother's brother. It is the woman, however, who acts as the, well, mediator of disputes within the clan, with her brother or uncle acting as her advisor. Traditionally, clans owned complex housing structures and shared land. A husband would live with his wife in her clan structure and farm his wife's clan's land. His wife's brother would discipline their children, and if a man was seen as an unsatisfactory husband, his wife could simply divorce him by placing his belongings outside the door. Now, how do you like that? Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Number 1. What aspect of kinship does the professor mainly discuss? Number 2. The professor notes that the common ancestor of a descent group may be... Number 3. Which statement accurately conveys a relationship described in the lecture? Number 4. What does the professor say about Chinese Su descent groups? Number 5. In what ways does the matrilineal descent system shape Hopi households? Choose two answers.
Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Now then, here's where descent groups get interesting. Anthropologists study the rules descent groups use to decide membership. Where do you draw that line between who are your relatives and who aren't, and what are the consequences? Number six. Why does the professor ask this? Where do you draw that line between who are your relatives and who aren't, and what are the consequences? Now listen to part of a conversation between a student and a university housing official. Hi, can I help you? Uh, yeah, I wanted to talk to somebody about my housing bill. Sure, maybe I can help you. What seems to be the problem? Well, see, uh, I got this bill in the mail the other day saying that I still owe two thousand three hundred dollars for my dorm room this semester, but um, I'm sure that I already paid it all. Hmm, that's strange. Let's take a look at your record in the system. What's your student ID number? Uh, three seven four two nine three seven. Okay, Jeff Terrence, right? Well, my computer is showing that we received a payment of three thousand seven hundred dollars on January sixth, but your total due for a single is six thousand dollars per semester. So your bill seems to be correct, actually. Would you like to pay the remainder now? No. Uh. Look, this can't be right. Did you say single, as in a single room? That's right. Our records show that you're in Smith Tower, room two fifteen, a single dorm room. Uh, well, I am in room two fifteen, just not in Smith Tower. I changed rooms at the end of the fall, but I'm still in Burns Hall, and I have a roommate now. Hmm. Um. Well then, uh, let's see. I think you're going to have to fill out an H-7 form requesting a refund of the two thousand three hundred dollars you still owe. What? That doesn't make sense. I shouldn't owe any money. But I mean, if you want to give me a refund, that's cool. You won't get an actual refund. That's just how we handle it on paper. Now wait a second. I just remembered that something like this happened last summer. What you can do actually is get your RA, the um resident assistant for your floor, to write a letter to the associate director of student housing, James Fredrickson. Ask your RA to verify that you are in Burns Hall, room two fifteen, and that you have a roommate. Then we'll update your record in our system and. Uh, hold on. I think I'd better get a pen to write this down. Okay. So who's this guy again? The one I need to write to? James Fredrickson. He's the associate director of this office. As I was saying, once your RA sends the letter and we update your record, you'll get a confirmation in the mail. Then you will have to stop by security to get a new sticker for your ID card. That sticker will prove that you're living where you are. Should there be any problems next semester with your housing bill? Sounds good. I just have one more question. Sure. Well, over at registration, they said I have a hold on my account since they think that I like owe money. How long do you think this will take? Let's see. If your RA gets the letter in today, we could probably have it cleared up in a day or two. Thanks. I'm on it. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Number seven. Why does the student go to the student housing office? Number eight. In which building does the student currently live? Number nine. What does the woman say the student needs to do after he gets a confirmation letter? Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. Hmm. Um. Well then,、uh, let's see. I think you're going to have to fill out an H-7 form requesting a refund of the two thousand three hundred dollars you still owe. What? That doesn't make sense. I shouldn't owe any money. But I mean, if you want to give me a refund, that's cool. Number ten. 
Why does the student say this? But I mean, if you want to give me a refund, that's cool. Listen again to part of the conversation. Then answer the question. Sounds good. I just have one more question. Sure. Well, over at registration, they said I have a hold on my account since they think that I, like, owe money. How long do you think this will take? Let's see. If your RA gets the letter in today, we could probably have it cleared up in a day or two. Number 11. What does the student imply when he says this? How long do you think this will take? Number 12. What will the student most likely do next? Now listen to part of a talk in an art history class. So, folks, this evening I want to move on from our previous discussion of Romanesque architecture to the new forms that emerged beginning in the, uh, 11th century, which came to be known as Gothic architecture. As you'll likely recall, Romanesque architecture mainly consisted of a return, after about a 600-year break, to using Roman forms and, um adapting them for the creation of a new generation of monumental structures. We talked about the development of arches, barrel vaults, and, um, in particular, the rebirth of monumental sculpture, specifically as seen in the great portals that were built in the 11th and 12th centuries. Now then, at the end of the 12th century, we also began to see the emergence of a new architectural style, Gothic. So, I hope all of you read the assigned chapters, so, uh, maybe someone could tell us about a few of the key features of Gothic architecture? Well, I seem to remember, uh, that the Gothic style emphasizes verticality, rising high and light, and, um, that they used, uh, let me just grab my notes here, uh, huge glass windows, skeletal structures, pointed arches, high vaults, and pointed spires. I think there were a few other features. Yeah, I remember the gargoyles, you know, those monster statues, and they also had the flying buttresses, right? That's right. I'm glad you brought up the pointed arch and the flying buttress, two very important innovations. As you may recall in the reading, the pointed arch allowed for tall windows, often made of intricate stained glass designs. Uh... You can see some of the most colorful and interesting examples at Sainte Chapelle in Paris. I think there's a picture of it in your book, actually. Right, then, the pointed arch, unlike the low, round Romanesque arch, allowed for tall windows and thus more light to enter than was possible in the older Romanesque churches and cathedrals. With the taller arches and colored stained glass windows, brighter, uh, more magnificent spaces could be created. The Gothic cathedrals are quite bold in their aspirations to soar to greater heights, into the heavens. Uh, so, next we have the flying buttress, the second feature of Gothic style that I want to talk about today. Um, one that was important to the full development of the Gothic cathedrals. Does anyone have an idea of why that might be? Uh, maybe they allowed the sculptors to position figures like the gargoyles and others high above but so that people on the ground could still see them. No, I don't think that's quite it. The book mentioned something about a buttress being a means of support, but I think that has to do with supporting walls, not sculptures. That's true. Earlier churches, even castles and Roman public buildings, used buttresses to support thick walls. So the flying buttress evolved from an existing form, and it allowed cathedrals to be built taller, by providing support for higher vaulted ceilings. Its function was to transmit the thrust, the outward force and weight, of a roof or a vault across an intervening space to a buttress on the outside of the building. By using flying buttresses, an architect could place windows or other openings in load-bearing walls, the walls that support the weight of the roof, which would allow more light to enter the building. Also, cathedrals could now soar to even greater heights, dizzying heights. 
For instance, if you look at the Ohm Cathedral in Germany, it rises to 530 feet, including the spire. Another feature of Gothic style that I believe was mentioned in your book. Now, 530 feet, that's pretty tall. We're talking taller than the first modern skyscrapers and built without the use of a steel skeleton or modern machinery. So, it was just made of stone? For the most part, structures built in the Gothic style, originally that is, there are modern copies, Gothic revival we call it, for the most part, Gothic structures of the Middle Ages were built entirely of carved stone blocks cemented together. Wood frames were used during construction and for some of the final decorative work, but rarely for structural purposes. And that, that brings me to the third feature I want to talk about, vaults. Remember the Romanesque vaults? Yeah, I think they, they had the rounded low vaults and then the longer barrel vault, and they had the broad, stout columns. Exactly. With the pointed arch and the flying buttress, among other changes that we'll get to, builders could create higher vaulted ceilings that were more open, more airy. Unlike the round Romanesque arch, the pointed arch distributed weight downward more effectively, thus allowing for narrower columns and more open vaulted areas, again, letting in more light and air throughout the building. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. Number 13. What is the talk mainly about? Number 14. By mentioning Romanesque architecture, the professor... Number 15. According to the talk, impressive cathedral windows were made possible by the use of... Number 16. The lecturer notes that the Cathedral of Ulm is remarkably... Listen again to part of the talk, then answer the question. For the most part, structures built in the Gothic style, originally that is, there are modern copies, Gothic revival we call it, for the most part, Gothic structures of the Middle Ages were built entirely of carved stone blocks cemented together. Number 17. Why does the professor say this? Originally that is, there are modern copies, Gothic Revival we call it. Number 18. According to the talk, which of the following architectural features matches each style? Speaking section. Describe a favorite leisure activity and explain why it is important to you. Include details and examples to support your explanation. Most universities have general education requirements to guide first-year students in choosing their courses. Some universities require students to take non-academic courses like physical education as part of their general education requirements. Others focus exclusively on academic subjects when setting their general education requirements. Which policy do you prefer and why? Include details and examples in your explanation. Townie College is proposing to reduce funding for the student newspaper. Read an administrator's announcement about the proposed budget cut. You will have 45 seconds to read the response. Begin reading now.
Now listen to two students as they discuss the announcement. Oh man, did you hear about how they're getting rid of the school newspaper? Yeah, I heard, but I don't see what the big deal is. When I first started here, nobody read it anyway, and they still don't read it. Everybody is too busy with other stuff. Yeah, I guess you're right. But still, every now and then I pick up a copy of the paper. Some of the comic strips are funny, and I really like that one guy's music column. Yeah, but you can still read it online. Like I said, what's the big deal? I guess it really isn't so important after all. That's what I'm saying. I mean, look, we have the best football team in the state. We should show our support and build them the best stadium as well. Besides, my dad went to this school and he says that he and other alumni are really excited about the new stadium. They might even give a big donation to help finance it. If it costs a little more money to make sure our stadium is the best, well, I think it's worth it. Who cares about a student newspaper anyway? I think it's more important that we express our pride in our college team. The man expresses his opinion of the announcement made by the college administrator. State his opinion and explain the reasons he gives for holding that opinion. Now read the passage about mutual symbiosis. You have 45 seconds to read the passage. Begin reading now. Now listen to part of a lecture on this topic. Today, um, we are going to talk about mutual symbiotic relationships. Perhaps the classic example of mutual symbiosis is that of bees and flowering plants. Bees travel from flower to flower in search of nectar and pollen. Back in their hives, the bees convert the energy-rich nectar and protein-rich pollen into food. With ample food supplies, the hive grows and flourishes. Okay, so bees have dense hairs on their legs that are used to collect pollen. As they fly from flower to flower gathering food, they are also spreading the pollen from one flower to another. Now, um, flowers have both male and female reproductive apparatus and in order for flowering plants to reproduce, one plant needs the pollen from another plant. And that's where the bees come in, inadvertently pollinating the plants, thus aiding in the plant's reproduction. Sometimes the relationship is that of a symbiote, living literally within a host. Let's take an example close to home, really close. Inside each of our intestines are billions of microscopic bacteria. I'm not referring to the ones that make you sick, but rather the bacteria that aid in digestion. See, without these beneficial bacteria, we couldn't digest much of what we eat. Moreover, the bacteria also help train the immune system to better identify and respond to harmful bacteria. Explain how the professor's examples demonstrate mutually symbiotic relationships. Now listen to a conversation between a student and his academic advisor. Hey, Miss Harris, it's registration time again. Hi, Dale. So how is your schedule for next semester coming along? Oh, not so great, actually. I'm trying to pick all my classes so I can finish my major by the end of the spring. The problem is there's this one upper-level chemistry course I need. Let me guess. The class is already filled up. Yeah. How'd you know? Another student came to see me this morning. Seems there are only two upper-level chemistry courses for majors, and both are filled up already. I'll tell you what I told her already. Go see the professors and ask them for special permission to register for the class. Hmm, that might work, except I've had the one professor before, and he's pretty strict about his classes not having too many students. And, uh, the other class, well, doesn't seem so interesting. Let's see, then. The other option is that you could talk to the department chair and see if you can do independent study. I mean, since you've started here, you've impressed me as a pretty bright and capable student. I mean, I wouldn't suggest this option to just anyone. Thanks. I hadn't considered that option at all. I've never done an independent study course before. I wonder what they're like.
the student and his advisor discuss two possible solutions to the man's problem. Describe the problem. Then state which of the two solutions you prefer and explain why. Now listen to part of a talk in an astronomy class. Today, I'd like to talk about how stars form. I'm sure all of you have read this week's chapter and are now familiar with the two key ingredients in star formation, interstellar gases and dust. It may be hard to imagine that there is much of anything in outer space aside from existing stars and planets. However, in the last class, I mentioned that space is not empty. In fact, 99% of space consists of very low-density gas. The remaining 1% consists of dust, just like the dust that accumulates under your bed. That gas and dust is distributed unevenly, and because it's not just spread all over the place, this has consequences for star formation. Half of all the interstellar gas is compressed into dense clouds called, well, nebulae, a term derived from the Latin word nebula, meaning cloud. These clouds can vary greatly in temperature and density. The uh, other half is found throughout the rest of the universe in extremely low densities. Now, a moment ago, I said that the distribution of the dust and gas has consequences for star formation. Well, that's because stars form when dense clumps of interstellar gas collapse. Consider the case of a small, dense nebula. To convert it into a star requires compression and heat. How, you may ask, does that happen? Well, that's a good question, since dense interstellar clouds are ordinarily stable. A tremendous amount of force is required to start a collapse and thus trigger compression. That force will come in the form of a shock wave traveling through space. One source of such a shock wave is the uh, supernova, which is an exploding star. When a strong enough shock wave hits the dense cloud of gas and dust, it causes the center to compress into a protostar. Then, as the protostar collapses into itself, it creates heat through nuclear fission and forms the core of a new star. Using points and examples from the talk, explain how stars form. Writing section. Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic you just read about. So, often in science, proponents of new technologies get excited and overlook other options. Take the problem of the hydrogen fuel cell car as a solution to the problems associated with climate change. It is now generally accepted that burning oil and other fossil fuels causes gases to be released into the atmosphere. Cars and other vehicles are major producers of greenhouse gases. And uh, we also know that as these gases build up, they act like a greenhouse, uh, raising the Earth's temperature. Changes in the climate have already resulted in the melting of glaciers in Greenland, and um, that means we may witness a rise in sea level. You may have heard about hydrogen fuel cell technology as a solution to this problem. However, you should know, well, proponents overemphasize the benefits of this technology. In fact, there are better ways to approach the problem of climate change that will bring more immediate benefits and are less costly. First, let's look at the problems with hydrogen fuel cell technology. Supporters estimate that with investment now, industry could have hydrogen cars on the road in 10 or 15 years. Well, that's too long if you're talking about making an impact in reducing greenhouse gases. It is a misdirection of resources. We need to cut greenhouse gases quickly, and uh, this can be done by increasing fuel efficiency now. For example, industry already is producing hybrid gasoline electric cars. We have them already, and um, with more support from government and the public, they could be the standard. Presently, these cars give off 30 to 50% less greenhouse gas than gasoline-only vehicles. But here, listen to this. With advances in the technology, a new generation of hybrids will run on ethanol gasoline blends that cut greenhouse gas emissions down to one-tenth of what hybrids today produce. The change is huge, and it can happen quickly. If you're going to invest in research and development, you'll get more for your money with ethanol blend hybrids 
and the results for the environment will come sooner. Secondly, supporters of the hydrogen car are too optimistic about the development of a supporting infrastructure. They wildly underestimate the costs. An important study showed that it would cost over $500 billion to create a hydrogen infrastructure for just 40% of light vehicles. And that's assuming more cars don't end up on the road. Okay, so this gets worse. Another study showed that it would cost $20 billion to supply just 2% of the cars with hydrogen by 2020. That's after you paid for the infrastructure. Besides, where does the hydrogen come from? It has to be made by burning fossil fuels. So while supporters may say hydrogen burns clean in your car, they are telling only half the story. A lot of greenhouse gases are created to make that hydrogen for your car. There are also costs associated with adopting hybrids and using more ethanol, um, ethanol requires special storage and delivery that costs money too, but current estimates are much lower than those for hydrogen.